Hello, everyone. Buenvenidos. Thanks for coming out to the Central Library today. My name is Diana Olivo Posner, and I am the Principal Librarian Associate Director for the Exploration and Creativity Department with the Los Angeles Public Library. And I'm Kevin Alcuni, also a librarian here in the Exploration and Creativity Department, and we're here to welcome you to this afternoon's LA Made Self-Help Graphics at 50, a cornerstone of Latinx art and collaborative art making. Sweet. Yeah. Shout out. <laughs> they can hear you. Now, before we begin, we'd like to take a moment to thank the National Endowment, Endowment to the Humanities, our Library Foundation, and our behind-the-scenes staff for helping bring the LA Made programs to you. LA Made focuses on the diverse landscape of Los Angeles, highlighting the immense artistic and performance talent that has developed in the course of the city's eclectic history. If you would like to see more of our amazing programs, please visit, visit our online calendar at lapl.org forward slash events, E-V-E-N-T-S. And for our LA Made programs, visit lapl.org forward slash LA Made, L-A-M-A-D-E. Uh, <clears throat> we'd also like to take this opportunity to recognize and acknowledge the first people of this land, honor their elders past and present, as well as their descendants who are citizens of these nations. For more information on which territory you may reside on, check out native-land.ca. Uh, just a couple of other housekeeping tips before we begin. Uh, please silence your electronic devices so we don't uh, distract our speakers. Uh, take a moment to locate the exits just in case for any reasons. Uh, if you parked in the garage uh, underneath the library today, you can get your parking ticket validated at the information desk in the main lobby. And it, parking will only be a dollar as long as you parked after 1 p.m. and leave before 5 p.m. Uh, lastly, please no eating or drinking in the auditorium unless it's bottled water. And the bathrooms are down the hallway to your right. And now for today's amazing program, Self-Help Graphics at 50, a cornerstone of Latinx art and collaborative art making. Join, artistic and join artists and scholars as they explore the 50-year history of Los Angeles' oldest Chicano Latino nonprofit art incubator, Self-Help Graphics art and Art. Known for its numerous fine art print and for in initial Initializing? Initiating. Initiating. Should put the glasses on. Yeah. Uh, Los Angeles version of the Day of the Dead. This conversation focuses on self-helps, community-based, uh, there we go, this is very long, Kevin, <laughs> philosophies and how artists have adapted and implemented these ethics in practice. Also, as you walked in, you might have noticed that there is a drop-in art activity sponsored by Self-Help Graphics in our courtyard area. So feel free to participate after this talk has concluded. And now, here to kick off today's program is Dr. John Vincent de Semivrale, art historian, <laughs> SAG ethnographer, and current faculty at Cal State San Bernardino. Woo! Yeah. Good morning, this, good afternoon, <laughs> and welcome to today's panel. Uh, Self-Help Graphics at 50, a cornerstone of Latinx art and collaborative art making. Uh, thank you for joining us on this beautiful Sunday. We wanna thank the LA Public Library, Kevin Awakuni, and the library staff for the invitation to be here, to gather here, to share stories. Self-Help Graphics is a special place. To many, it is a sacred space in the collective imaginary in the city. Next slide, please. It began as a unique cultural infrastructure built by artist sister Karen Bocalero, Carlos Bueno, and Antonio Ibanez in 1973. This unlikely team of, Fra of a Franciscan nun and two gay undocumented Mexican artists came together in Boyle Heights to create one of the longest lasting and scrappiest arts organizations in Los Angeles history. In a city whose white art establishment consistently ignores the creative output of communities of color, self-help has nurtured the creative forces of East Los Angeles for 50 years and has done so on a shoestring budget. Just as this unjust distribution of arts funding and infrastructure continues in Los Angeles, so too 
does self-help's mandate of supporting artists in any way it can. Next slide, please. From its beginning, it was unique because it offered shelter, resources, and classrooms for free. Next slide. Together, the self-help founders would set up a nationally recognized silkscreen studio, the Barrio Mobile Art Van, pictured here, a modified mobile art studio that offered lessons in Chicano and Mexican art history in parking lots and street corners. And last but definitely not least, next slide please, this cohort would establish Los Angeles' version of Day of the Dead, one of the greatest vehicles for cultural resistance that continues its work into the present. Our, si <clears throat> excuse me. Our city has a little understood history of its sacred sites. And by that, I mean places that create space for spiritual work. Some of you may know that this land where the library sits is Tovangar, the great Tongva village. That sacred site has been partially buried by colonialism and the modern LA urban landscape, but asphalt and concrete are no match for the seeds the Tongva planted. While we do not have time to cover all these sites that would follow, you should know about places like city matriarch Biddy Mason's First AME Church, which functioned as a multi-purpose spiritual and cultural workshop for LA's historic black community. A unique space where soul and body were nourished and given space for artistic expression. Next slide, please. Part of this spiritual landscape is Immaculate Heart College. The Catholic College in the Hollywood Hills where Sister Karen Bocalero, one of the co-founders of Self Help, trained in the 1960s under legendary artist and nun Sister Corita Kent, pictured here with her work, The Juiciest Tomato. A beloved figure in Los Angeles, Kent's, quote, we have no art, we do everything as well as we can, philosophy, would influence generations. When Bocalero co-established a screen sprinting studio and the Day of the Dead tradition in LA, she was continuing on with a radical, cultural, Catholic mandate her teacher, Corita, had established. From Samela Lewis's Museum of African American Art on the third floor of the Macy's of South Los Angeles to Self Help Graphics, the oldest Chicano art center in our city, these places have nurtured communities of color when the mainstream art establishment refused. Collectively, they built the infrastructure to support artists of color in a segregated city, and they trained and supported thousands of artists who came from communities who could not afford art school, or worse yet, from communities that believe that art really wasn't, quote unquote, for us. A painful reality learned through the mainstream art space's preference for the European tradition of art as an elite site of distinction for a selective demographic. While increasing attention builds around community art spaces in Los Angeles, they're all plagued by the same disastrous racialized aesthetic economy that devalues the labor of black, indigenous, Latinx, hands as somehow inferior to the artwork made by white hands. Since the founding of the city's first museums, this order has never changed, even though this hi hierarchy of visual valuation must end. As they say in the streets in these parts, aquí estamos y no nos vamos. Next slide, please. In a panel of an hour, we cannot cover the 50 years of work that self-help accomplished. Uh, slide, next slide, please. If you're interested in learning more, please see the recent publication from scholars Tatiana Reynosa and Karen Mary Davalos, of which Dr. Zapata and myself are included. Uh, it's a lovely book. For today, we have brought together a panel who can speak to self-help's historic importance, but equally to the important work it is doing right now, today. Next slide, please. We begin with one of self-help's greatest maestras, Irena Cervantes. A th a th agreed. A third generation Chicana born in Garden City, Kansas in 1952, raised in Southern California and currently based in Los Angeles, Irena works primarily in painting, printmaking, and muralism. She earned a BA in fine arts from UC Santa Cruz and an, MP and an MFA from UCLA. She is a professor emerita, having dedicated 20 years of teaching in the Department of Chicano Chicano Studies at Cal State uh, Northridge. Next slide, please. Through her art, teaching, and community activism, she has contributed to the discourse of an ever-evolving Chicanx aesthetic. 
Her body of work reflects over 40 years of exploration and is informed by native Mesoamerican mythology and cosmology, Mexican art traditions, and Chicanx poetics, as well as by themes of environmental justice, globalization, and international struggles for human rights. Her danza Ocelotl, uh, next slide, please. Nope, sorry, one slide back. We've skipped ahead. We go one back. Her Danza Ocelotl, seen here, has become an iconic print, not only for its beauty, but for its powerful insistence on indigenizing the Chicano visual vocabulary. And as this seminal print, printed at Self-Help Graphics, testifies, no one did it better than Los, in Los Angeles than Irena. Irena has been doing demanding, the demanding work of decolonization, and she remains one of our most important touchstones for how to do this work. Next slide, please. Mio Stevens Gandhar is an LA-based artist working in various media, including photography, drawing, embroidery, and printmaking. Her imagery explores issues of ancestry, migration, feminism, cultural identity, and environmental degradation. She received her BFA from California College of the Arts and MFA from the California Institute of the Arts. Mio's work can be found in the collections of LACMA, the Museum of the Latin American Art, Riverside Art Museum, and private collections in the US and internationally. Next slide, please. Her most recent collaboration with self-help was the Day of the Dead commemorative print, Evergreen, seen here. A deep meditation on Los Angeles' cultural and necropolitics. It was Evergreen Cemetery where the first Day of the Dead took place. And Mio's work, which my students love, keeps up, kicks up the earth to tell the multiplicity of stories that make up this city. In a city in love with its colonial singular narrative, Mio's work opens a space between living and dead to hear the chorus of voices that sing from the land. Next slide, please. Natalie Godinez is a Los Angeles-based artist, educator, and community advocate raised in Tijuana, Mexico. Natalie's work explores her experience as a trans-border dweller and immigrant mother. Her work aims to be a tool for conversations about shared experiences, the possibilities of our imagination, and our desires to, cre to, change and to change the world. Natalie is also a collaborator of AMBOS projects. AMBOS stands for Art Made Between Opposite Sides, a platform for binational artists to speak on border issues, where she has performed in artistic interventions and has coordinated humanitarian aid efforts. Currently, she works at Self Help Graphics, doing advocacy, youth programming, and cultural organizing. Godinez holds a bachelor's degree of, of applied design from San Diego State University. Next slide, please. Natalie's Aquí es donde soñamos, This is Where We Dream from 2023, seen here, explores the border as a place full of possibilities where many people grow up between languages and cultures, but constantly are threatened by militarization and barriers at the border. As Godinez describes, quote, the snails carry their home like we carry our culture with symbols of growth throughout. Watchful eyes represents a sense of surveillance, both literal and figurative." End quote. Finally, my dearest colleague, Dr. Claudia Zapata. Dr. Zapata is the curator of Latinx art at the Blanton Museum of Art in Austin, Texas. A highly decorated scholar, Dr. Zapata, most recently worked on the Smithsonian American Art Museum's Printing the Revolution, the Rise and Impact of Chicano Graphics, the most recent authoritative retrospective of Chicanx, Chicano printmaking. Claudia's feminist, queer, and digital humanities scholarship has put them at the forefront of Latinx studies, and we eagerly look forward to their upcoming exhibitions at the Blanton. We are enormously grateful to have them join us today for this conversation. Now, I will sit down and we will open up our conversation. How's the sound? Great. Okay. Wonderful. Okay. Well, thank you so much for everyone who's in attendance. And of course, thank you to the artists because otherwise we wouldn't be here if they weren't doing everything that they have done throughout their career. So we're going to start some, with some questions for a little bit, and then we're going to open it up to the crowd. Okay. So. Self-help has been an alternative site of apprenticeship for artists for 50 years. You all have extensive histories working and learning at self-help. 
Can you tell us about any important learning experiences you've had at self-help? What skills did you learn there? What did you learn about art and community from self-help? How is learning at self-help different from other educational institutions? And this is open to anyone to respond. Um, hello, everybody. I'm very happy to be here, and I'm really honored to be here with my uh, distinguished colleagues here. <laughs> so, uh, well, how is self-help different, and what did I learn? What kind of experiences? It's really, um, it's really endless. I have to say that um, once I, I was uh, fortunate to, enough to go to undergraduate school and then later graduate school, but. Um, when I was out of undergraduate school, which was in the late, uh, late 70s, I was really um, hungry for a place that would really um, in inspire, but also n nurture and cultivate some of the directions in, in my, um, my work, but also in, in what my, my concerns were. Um, I came to Self Help Graphics in 1980, had been attending some of the Day of the Dead events since 1977. But prior, I had worked in, um, as a CETA artist in residence in Long Beach. So I was already pretty much rooted in community in terms of how I wanted my work to, 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 to be expressed and how I would hoped that it would impact people in a positive way and community. But when it came to Self Help Graphics, that was really the most amazing experience. I was there from about 80 to 85, 86. And um, self-help is really the place where I found community, a community of artists, but community in general, a place where my work and my aesthetic would be taken seriously. Um, because you probably have experienced some of this if you're artists. And um, when I was uh, learning about art and studying art in, in the university, there was really nothing about the art of, of people of color at that time, let alone much representation. So when I came to self help graphics, it was a, a really um, important uh, world that I was entering because I met, besides the fact that I met so many powerful artists and interesting artists that became my peers, um, Patsy Valdez, Margaret Garcia, um, Every artist that you could think of from my generation, more or less, probably passed through the doors of self-help graphics, Gronk, you know, uh, Magoo, so many others. And, um, and it was a place where we were able to um, have discourse about the work that we were doing and to learn from each other, and not to mention the fact that many of us became artists in residence through the California Arts Council. So it was really one of the most important experiences in shaping our pedagogy and also in terms of teaching and being able to take that outside of self-help graphics afterwards. And of course, as JV mentioned, this is at a time where, where mainstream galleries or museums were really not interested in, in, in the work, and not only from the Chicano community, but other communities of color. So I learned really, it shaped my pedagogy. It helped me to learn how to write grants better because we had to write our own grants. Uh, it helped me to be able to, to understand what a Chicana, Chicanx aesthetic was and that w we did indeed have an aesthetic. And um, just the fact that I was able to be mentored. I didn't really have mentors until after undergraduate school and my mentors were women. They, it was Sister Karen Bocalero, I could say she really mentored me, and Schiffer Goldman, one of the first uh, art historians to write about Chicana, Chicanex, Latinx art. And so for all of those things, I'm, I'm, I'm forever grateful because I was able to take those experience, again, out into the world, and, um, and it made me not only a better uh, maestra, a better teacher, but a better person, and it helped me to have confidence. I think that's really important because one of the things I guess my my artist colleagues here would, would agree on is that you have to be able to believe in yourself and have confidence to move forward, especially sometimes in a world that's not that is not um, welcoming or it's not encouraging. So those were the those were the gifts that that I was able to get, you know, by being um, a participant 
and to, to be an artist uh, working and learning in self-help graphics. And of course, Sister Karen Bocalero, um, you know, learning from her, as JV mentioned, she was a student of Sister Corita Kent, and so she brought so much, you know, to, to the philosophy of self-help graphics that, that we were able to learn from. So that, I think, I'll stop there. Um, yeah, I I would um, I agree with what you said. I mean, you're the legacy artist, and I, I feel like we learn by looking at your prints. You know, so that's one way that I learned by being a with self help graphics. I started going there in high school with my husband, and um, yeah, we we just learned by looking at first as young people, seeing that art was not didn't always have to be a perfectly framed picture in a white space with perfectly contained in a frame. It was at self-help, it was very grassroots. It was very, um, art can come out of the frame. It can be, uh, you know, freestanding. It can occupy spaces in a gallery like the corner where um, other galleries would carefully avoid placing art in the corner. So it was more than just like formal ways of showing art, but what an artist could be is so, you know, the apprenticeship for me was started more as what was possible and then became later when I was an artist coming back there to, to learn and to teach was learning from other artists on techniques, more, you know, things, how to be resourceful, how not to waste materials, what other materials that were maybe not traditional materials could be used to make something. So, um, yeah, so many different forms of learning from self-help um, that I got from that experience. Mio, before you uh, hand it over to Natalie, so what attracted you and your husband early on to, to go to self-help? Punk music. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think for me, um, coming to work at Self-Help Graphics, I didn't realize how seen I was going to feel. Um, I was just talking earlier with y'all that um, going to school at San Diego State, I'd never felt seen. Um, and I think that's the one thing. And I also have learned how to not be afraid to make art. I think through like the other artists in residence or like the colleagues, I think people really push you to like make art. And also working with the youth, they teach you the most not to be afraid because they come up with really crazy ideas for things they want to do. and. My role is to mentor them and do things with them. So I'm like, okay, let's go. <laughs> so I think that's been a really big learning thing for me at self-help, just being really saying yes like to the youth and also saying yes to myself. Great, thank you. So we're going to go a little bit more in depth in terms of your own artistic practice. So you all share a common reflection on forced displacement. Natalie, your 2022 curatorial project, Imaginary Dwellings, engaged with the systemic inequities perpetuating housing insecurity. Mio, with your 2016 self-help print about the Chavez Ravine and the community's displacement to make Dodger Stadium. And Idena has had an extensive career in solidarity with Central American groups and their perpetual massacre and diaspora. How does the concept of forced displacement present itself throughout your work and why do you return to it? Um, so one of my roles at Self Help Graphics is doing advocacy around housing justice. Um, so actually that um, exhibition you mentioned, Marbella, who's here, invited me to co-curate with her with the intention of including a lot of the art that we make for the movement. So banners, um, things like that. And then it ended up expanding into including other issues um, such as the border issues that I'm really tied to being from the border and being part of um, the collective and then also just globally other issues of displacement that um, you know we we feel connected to. Um, for example, which is really relevant right now, the struggle of the Palestinian people. I was also including it in that in that exhibition. So I think um, for me, I think it's just 
it's connected to my own experience um, and also um, now with the work I do at self-help, um, really wanting to highlight um, those issues through the art um, because it helps more people to see it. I think sometimes when people talk about issues of displacement, uh, people don't want to hear about it, but if you make something that people are attracted to, um, they have more curiosity to learn more. Uh, yeah, my work, I, 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 displacement is, can affect people in profound ways that goes beyond just simply uh, housing affordability. Um, I also do work that's about refugees and I'm doing a series of embroideries of uh, refugee camps. Um, that started because my own family was incarcerated during the World War II. Japanese Americans were incarcerated. So I started by embroidering that camp and then seeing the similarities and all the other types of refugees, G camps um, that people have to endure and they might be escaping war or environmental crises or other issues and so that is how displacement kind of follows through the other forms of my artwork. Well, I have to say that I think that um, addressing these different issues of displacement have been an important part of my expression, you know, uh, for many years. I mean, almost since I started as a, as, you know, as a professional artist. Um, and that is because I, so, ma so many of the issues that are happening in the, you know, not only in the past, but in the present, you know, I find resonance with in terms of my own experience. I'm um, older than the two other panelists, but it, it sometimes it amazes me how much things need to change and how much they haven't changed. And then, of course, you have to acknowledge the changes that have happened. So um, because of my own experience and because I, I do uh, really connect with other communities that have been disenfranchised, that are marginalized, because this was my experience, especially as a child in the 50s. Um, and so, I think, um, for example, um, I did a piece not long ago called The Guardians of Naturaleza or La Naturaleza, The Guardians of Nature. And it was addressing, you know, the um, uh, environmental justice workers and, and activists, it, primarily in Latin America, but most of the activists that have been killed are, are activists from Mexico and Latin America. Um, and that's another kind of of displacement and disenfranchisement and, and exploitation of resources. So, you know, in terms of working in community, in terms of trying to voice those concerns for women that have felt marginalized, displaced, etc. And of course, as, as Natalie said, we cannot turn a blind eye to what's happening currently. And so it's important for me as an artist and an activist to express solidarity for all those groups that are seeking self-determination as my community has, and you know, to to support not only you know the movements and the people in Latin America, but worldwide, and and particularly you know for a, advocating for a Palestine libre. Great, thank you so much. So, I would identify the group cultural bearers. Cultural bearers are, quote, critical to the preservation and continuance of ancestral and cultural knowledge. Can you describe how you align yourselves with such an identity in addition to that of an artist? And how do you employ printmaking specifically to translate this personal call to protect cultural legacies? Um, I would answer that in a couple of different ways. One is uh, for my own personal culture. I mean, I'm always, I feel like as somebody who's comes from Japanese American ancestry, I'm trying to understand what my cultural background is all the time. And I feel, I'm, sh I'm sure a lot of other people might identify with the feeling that you are of a certain people, but at the same time being American, you feel 
uh, not quite that uh, from that place, you know. So you're always trying to figure out where you belong. So part of part of my artwork is that. But um, as a cultural, uh, you know, somebody who advocates for people's cultural legacies, I think the way I really do the work is teaching, you know. And I think what I say in my art is important, and my art is very important. But as an artist. I think my teaching practice is the most important part of who I am as an artist, is, is working with young people and trying to show them how to do something technically, but really the subtext is also, tell me who you are and how we can talk about who you are and what you want to say in an effective way through your art. And, and for me, that is, I feel the most useful part of my practice as an artist is that part. Really beautiful night. Um, that's a big question. Uh, but um, <laughs> um, I think um, there's, I guess, different, like you said, different ways to answer the question. And one is um, a lot of my work is craft based, um, which I think connects to my culture um, and to things that I got passed down to me and my mom. Um, and I think that's one way I think I could consider myself a culture bearer. Um, but I also uh, resonate with my Mio said, and I think um, the part that I feel very passionate about in my work is working with young people and um, mentoring them. And I think that's um, one of the things that makes me like really excited to make art um, and making art with community. So I think um, creating in community is the most important for me. And I think that's also part of um, being a culture bearer. Well, I think um, part of, of, of being a culture bearer, uh, especially for my generation, was reclaiming those aspects of our culture that we really didn't know about. So we, it was really an exploration of personal, personal identity. And for many of my artist friends that are women, it was about reclaiming, you know, our power as women and, and you know, being feminists. And, and um, all of those things, I think, were really important in terms of, like, first being able to understand, you know, and to reclaim what it meant, you know, for, for ourselves, our community, uh, you know, um, and those cultural symbols and philosophies, et cetera, that would really empower us. Um, of course, um, as I said, a lot of my work addresses trying to really um, clarify, you know, and bring, bring to the forefront, you know, what it is to be Chicana, what it is to be a person of color in this society, um, to be a woman, all of those different things. I have one piece of artwork, it's called Nepantla, that particularly addresses that, Nepantla. It literally means the space in between or a torn between. And I think many cultures experience this. Maya, Maya just, or Mio just mentioned it, you know, being in between those different cultures of what your, uh, your ethnicity is and, and being a person of color in the United States. So that is, that is one aspect of, again, just trying to kind of reclaim those symbols, identities, and philosophies. And a big part of my my work as a culture bearer has been to try and, and share not just, you know, what, what I have done, but what, you know, many artists have done in terms of my teaching and, um, and cultivating and encouraging my students and, and also um, just mentoring when I can. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, you know, I wanted to pick up where Natalie was, was pointing to. And I want to hear, um, or if you could share with the audience, how is community part of your work? Who is your community? How does community inform it? What do you hope your work does in and for community? Um, I, th I mean, I think um, my community is, there's different communities that I'm part of. Um, but my community are fellow artists, fellow activists, um, people like me who are um, from the border, like transfronterizos. Um, and um, I think also 
a, a community of um, just other creative people um, who maybe are not artists, but um, use their creativity in like their daily lives. Um, but I think, yeah, I don't think I'm part of one community. I think a lot of my communities kind of intersect. Yeah, I, my community is many things like Natalie. I mean, um, my community is, I mean, the community that's very close to my heart are the artists that self-help graphics. And by the way, there's several very talented people in the audience today. I'm not gonna point you out, but I mean, we're, we're among great people. Um, so the, those people, I mean, the print shop in general is a place of camaraderie, sharing skills. It's different than the painters, you know, alone in the studio painting. Um, printmakers, we share ideas, we share tools, we share press, we, um, it's all about sharing. So, I mean, that's a big part of a print community of artists. Um, Self-help graphics is where I can go to make something that I know I can't do alone in my studio, and I've got, like, the biggest silk screen print I want to make, and Dewey Tafoya has the longest arms who can actually make it happen where I physically can't. So there's that community. I wouldn't be anywhere without them. Um, and then there's you know my, my local community. So I teach at Rio Hondo College, and that is the community that I grew up in. I went to Shore High School, Montebello. So um, I get to teach people that look like my friends in high school and so that's a very nice feeling and a nice kind of bubble I get to live in and I get to mentor them and help them to realize that they can be an artist and do things like I'm doing in my community so um, that's that's what my community is. Let me ask you what you hope your work does in community because I know the question had a lot of additional questions in it but just specifically you know what my you, artwork? <laughs> yeah, what do you hope it does, or what do you know it does? I mean, oh, I could talk about the Evergreen print, for example, which Please. was an incredible honor to be asked to make. Can uh, we go to that slide? Can we show that slide, please? Yeah, I was asked by Marvea um, to do this Dia de los Muertos print, and I was, uh, I was kind of scared because I'm Asian, and, you know, I... I felt like an, an incredible responsibility. So I made that print thinking about who's going to look at it, how can I make this for this community of people who appreciate the Dia de los Muertos at self-help. And so I tried to um, find a location to set the scene in that we all can identify with. I have uh, an ancestor who's buried there in the Japanese part of that cemetery, and so that's my personal connection, but also that, you know, we have this legacy of artists that have done Dia de los Muertos and have taught us many things, and so I wanted to kind of, you know, tip my hat to them, and um, yeah, talking about the various communities that have, have used the space, been buried in that space, and the coyote image represents a native uh, part of that space, and so, um, yeah, that is one way I hope, like, I was really hoping people would like it just, be, and usually with my art, I make it, and if people like it, great, but I, you know, this is what I'm making, but for that print, I really actually did want people to like it, and I'm so grateful that it seems like people like it, uh, regardless, it was a little Japanese lady who made it, so. Oh, my community? Well, most definitely um, self-help graphics over the years. I've, I think I've built a, a big community and been so honored and it's been a pleasure to meet all of these amazing artists. So that is definitely one community that I have. I taught for the last um, 20 years at a really great department at Cal State Northridge was a Chicana, Chicano Studies Department. And, you know, I think part of being community as well was, is about um, bridging communities. And some of my work has been about that. Um, it was mentioned earlier that I worked a lot with the Central American community, particularly in the 80s. And, and that was a really important time. And not met that many people know that there was such a strong support and solidarity from the Chicano and Chicana arts community. Um, especially in the Bay Area, but in Los Angeles. And so, you know, many of those people, you know, I feel are my community. I've been so enriched over the years to be able to know all of these different people. 
and to and to be able to, um, of course, learn and exchange and and now you know learning even more about some of the younger artists. There's so many amazing generations of artists, so many amazing artists now. So so all of this, I think, has really been my community. Um, most recently, I was able to with with one of my colleagues from uh, Northridge. We went to to create community with some of the Aborig Aboriginal women in. Australia, and it was all around different ways of celebrating and acknowledging life and death. And so that's another community. So I think that, as Natalie mentioned, you know, our, our communities intersect. And so, you know, it's like embracing all of those, all of those experiences and all of those um, expressions that, that resonate with us. Let me get to that sub question before you give back the mic, Irina. So the, what, you, you you know you you've exhibited your work in lots of places and you have probably had so many different types of audience responses or maybe have seen some of your work in different places maybe that touched you do you have any stories about people using your work or coming up to you to talk about your work and to to explain you know how how it's part of people's lives or any stories like that you could share with us uh, well I think um, I was privileged to help coordinate the first women's atelier, the Maestras Atelier, and I think the print that I did is Mujer de Mucha Nagua, Pati Chicana. Mujer de Mucha Nagua means a woman with a lot of petticoat, and, and actually what it means is a woman with a lot of power. And I love that image, you know, it's like, you know, a woman, no, not a woman with a lot of balls, a woman with a lot of petticoat, right? And so I think that uh, the most response that I've had from from my work has maybe been from that that piece because it addresses, um, you know, uh, feminism and struggle throughout um, the U.S., Mexico, Latin America, and I think those um, experiences where it's it's very meaningful when you meet people that um, connect to your work and, and understand what you're trying to say and also bring something to your work. Yeah, one more question for you, I think. I wanted to comment Go real on. quick on that print, the Mujer de Mucha en Agua, Pati Chicana. So that work is part of the Smithsonian American Art Museum collection. So it's now become a canonical Chicana artwork. And I think what gets lost when we're thinking about self-help and in general printmaking, usually that's what we're talking about, works on paper in terms of what's produced at, at the print center at self-help, is that it's very similar to currency, that it gets circulated, the prints and the artwork, they end up in, throughout the nation. They're taken out of context in terms of it was produced as part of a specific group of artists working together under a specific theme. And so then you see it extracted from that original context. And so there are several instances working across the nation as a curator where people see a print and they may not know that it's self-help, but usually what the designation when you're thinking about a fine art print is what's called a chop. So there's this lower register information on a work of art. So if you ever walk into a museum, there's all these signals as to the birthplace of this object. And there's usually a signature, there's usually a little fraction that tells you how many works were produced and what number this is. And then there's a, what's called a chop. And so if you've ever gotten anything notarized, that sort of indention that's made. So it's this logo of the print center. And so I've been in so many instances where people say, this is a wonderful print, where is it coming from? And they have no idea self-help produced it. They had no idea it's coming from the heart of LA. It's so removed from that experience. And so what's great about Irena's work is that several of her prints are now being circulated and now being appreciated at not only the LA level, but the national level, and will be preserved and taken into consideration as a pivotal moment of American art history as we know it. So I think I need to reiterate, I'm so, um, really grateful to self-help graphics because self-help has really been able to circulate the work in so many places, not just in the US, but abroad in Latin America, and has really given 
uh, a really profound kind of exposure that perhaps as an individual artist, you wouldn't have been able to have. So I'm deeply grateful to have had that opportunity and, and also uh, I'm sure my other artist friends that have printed at Self-Help Graphics feel the same way. So, so yay, Self-Help Graphics, thank you. Agreed. Uh, the chop actually is uh, that image there uh, on the right in the zero. And that was designed by Leo Limon, a uh, very important artist for self-help's early history and up until the present. I think we're going to move into our final question so we can have some time from the audience to ask any questions that you might have. So regrettably, self-help remains a somewhat under-acknowledged site of creative production in this city. What would you like our audience to know about self-help? What are ways that our audience can support your practices, self-help, and other artists? I think the most important thing with self-help is show up. Um, there, if there's a workshop, if there's an exhibition, people are always like, how can I get involved? I'm like, just keep showing up. And you know, like that's kind of how it is. Um, I think, um, it's a it it's a place that like if you give a lot like you get a lot back. So I see a lot of people, and the short time that I've been at self help, there's people who are like I've been part of this organization since the beginning, um, and I think that's really amazing that people keep coming back even if they leave. The people always come back. Yeah. So just show up. And what about you? How can the audience support artists like that, like the work that you do? Oh, um, I guess. Follow me on Instagram. What, I don't know. <laughs> what, what's your handle? Uh, it's my name, Natalie M. Godinez. If you want to collaborate, I'm always down for collaborations. Uh, yeah. I would like to say, yeah, support. I mean, if you support self-help, and you can support them by buying prints so they could increase their, their they have a capital com campaign going on. They, we need to do uh, some renovations on the building. We are now uh, sharing different spaces temporarily because of those renovations. So if anybody wants to go to the self help Graphics website and donate money, buy a print, you're, if you do that, you're supporting all of us. And in profound ways, you're supporting us, the working artists, you're supporting the next generation of artists that are trying to take workshops there. You're supporting school programs in which Self-Help Graphics has, you know, been going to different school programs and doing different projects, the Barrio Mobile Art Studio. I mean, there's a, an incredible amount of activities that Self-Help Graphics does to support communities, uh, both artists and non-artists, young people, um, people who have housing um, instability, you know, so there's so many programs they're working on, so in very real ways you can help with money. Um, so, yeah, that's all I'm going to say about it. Well, I think you all said it all, and, and, and absolutely, please, you know, support the artists, support the art, support the workshops, donate money, all of it. Um, I just want to say arts organizations, the people that work there are so dedicated, committed, beyond you know, the expectation. I had the experience of doing a self-help graphics Day of the Dead a few years ago in terms of creating an ofrenda by a wonderful artist, Noni Olubisi. And I have to tell you, just to be there again and to see how hardworking the staff is and how they you know, um, are, are such a team. They really are a team. How they are, you know, it's a collective effort, but and I have to say, you know, the staff at the time was composed of mostly women and Dewey, like we always say, <laughs> and Dewey. And, and um, it, I was just um, blown away, you know, inspiration and motivation that the whole staff had. And I particularly want to thank Natalie and Marvea because they were very patient and very uh, helpful. So yes, please do support self-help graphics because especially at this time of transition, when they come back, you know, full force, it's really important for you to come back with your patronage. So anyway, yeah, please support. Thank you. I just wanted to make one last comment in terms of supporting self-help. 
institutions like this, the most important thing is just to keep them in your memory. Even if you, I think there's this concern that if you're not an art collector, you're not supporting. Like, I don't have enough money, I can't buy a print. But there are several aspects of the institution's history that so many people have connected to, punk music, educational programs, community programs, altars, I mean, you name it. Someone knows someone who has gone to self-help and benefited from it. And so just even having a sticker of self-help on your water bottle continues that legacy of thousands and thousands of community workers, artists, friends, and yourself of how much you can make a difference in just having a memory of this hard work as some sort of perpetual flame of Chicano and BIPOC creation and support. It doesn't involve money per se. It's more about just a shared solidarity about the possibility of making a better art world together. Amen. Um, and what a way to promote the organization here right now with all of your testimonies, um, your histories, your ongoing promotion of the organization, and your hopes also for its futures. Uh, we also hope a great deal for a bigger and a brighter future for self-help, in which this city will give city funding at larger scale in order to increase the scope of what it does. Because, as many of you might know, within a contemporary art world, a lot of what gets discussed is about serving communities of color. There are organizations that already do that. They are on the ground every day uh, working. And so to the many hands that have historically made self-help what it is, to the hands that carry it now and into the future, we thank you so much. Because as art historians, as Claudia said, we just write about it and do the research on it. Um, and we thank you for making it and for all those hands that do the maintenance of supporting it. Uh, we'll open it now for Questions, unless the panel has any outstanding business. Any questions from our audience for our panelists? So if you could just raise your hand and then we'll bring the mic over to you, if anybody has anything. No pressure. Um, so I, I learned about, um, there's an anthology on um, Audible about uh, Latino, the roots of punk rock. Um, as it relates to Latinos and Latinas. Um, and there is a story about how um, self-help graphics, because many um, punk rock Latinos in the, in the 70s and 80s, they didn't have a place to play um, because a lot of clubs wouldn't allow them to play, wouldn't book them. Um, and so they had, um, they'd been playing at um, self-help graphics, and apparently there was um, a bunch of kids from Orange County who came in and one night and basically trashed the place um, while there was a concert going on. I want and they they went into they talked about it and then they said there wasn't any other shows there after that, um, but. That was that was the that was the only tidbit of information. I'm really curious as to if anybody at Self Help has any access to the bigger picture, the bigger story of 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 that period of time, um, and what happened with that. Well, I would say one of the persons that would probably be able to address that is Diane Gamboa who is very much a part of, of the whole uh, Chicana, Chicano punk scene. Um, Richard Duardo, who also was an amazing printer, uh, was really involved in, in Chicana, Chicano punk. He could probably tell you, but, but he's deceased. He passed away a few, few years ago. So there is, um, there is some documentation. There was a show, I guess, in Pomona on some of the uh, Chicana, you know, punk you know, uh, musicians. Uh, that would be something maybe that you might want to look into. I, I don't remember everybody that wrote about it, but um, but that would be important. I think JV knows. Yeah, me. I think that's Pilar Tompkins Rivas' text. Uh, and I think it is called the Vex. 
Um, and I think some of that history is in there. The other person that's part of this is Willie Heron. Willie Heron is, as far as I understand, the Vex, um, along with his collaborators. Uh, and it was very brief, precisely because of what you were saying. So what's important about that story is that self-help, uh, Sister Karen, Carlos Antonio, and then when they leave, Sister Karen, are very open to this space serving a wide range of cultural needs. So if artists came in, like Pete Tovar, we were in the studio talking with Pete Tovar the other day, Pete Tovar came to Sister Karen and said, I want to do a shop here where we're selling handmade craft goods, a variety of things. Can we do that? She said, give me a proposal. And then she did it. That's the same with the Vex. So her own and company then came up with an idea. And then they said, we'd like to do this. She made space for it. Up until it then became dangerous <laughs> or damaging or violent. And then she, she closed it. But that spoke to her, her radical vision of what an art community center could be. Um, and when it then got taken advantage of in this way where there was a lot of destruction done, and I don't know all the details, um, I've only heard some of them, um, but once the violence then happens, it puts an end to it. But it does speak to the range of ways Sister Karen acted as a cultural, literally her body was like cultural infrastructure for, for, for this variety of, of artistic making and cultural work. So uh, that catalog will give you a good take on it. The other person to talk to is Willie Haran. Yeah, I wanted to add on to that idea of reframing an art space. There's this assumption that an art space has to act and look a certain way. There's this sort of clinical white wall nature to museums. You can't touch anything. It's very pristine. You don't have access to it. And that's one of these benefits of self-help where there is a gallery space. It does act as this presenting space. But there's also this... this sort of interaction with the museum space that a lot of community members have that I don't belong here, what do I wear, how do I act, am I being surveilled, there's security, there's all these elements that make it unsafe or make it fearful. And so this idea of an art space that is nimble and it's adaptive and it's receptive to the community also is this very interesting perspective of reading self-help as this other space and this idea of that space having so many stories to it and this punk chapter is one that always comes up. It's always, a, it's always either a footnote, it's a sentence, it's a couple of paragraphs, but people always mention it. But there's so many stories to self-help's history that you're, you as an art historian or as a scholar, you always find more in the archives. You find maybe one line or one little bit of data that you keep seeing this name, you keep seeing these like whispers of all these happenings, and you're like, what was that? There's a finality to the art object. So when we're talking about self-help as a print residency program, it's great because there's an object and it has a title and a name. Sometimes you have a title, that's also another story, but there's a finality to it versus these moments where the community got together they kind of made something happen. It was temporary. There's a radical nature to it, so it's already combating archives and formality. And so that's kind of something both interesting and challenging as a scholar, that you want to learn more, but maybe there's not a flyer left over. And that's where you really have to rely on the community members to be these archives, them themselves, their stories. And you have to go out and do interviews so it's a very different jump in terms of like formal academia where you're expected to go to archives or everybody knows this history and you're kind of delving a little bit more into detail. Not everybody knows this history of self-help or sees it as relevant to an art historical story. The fact that there's punk content, that integrated into the artwork as well. So it seeps over. It's not just this additional programming. But it's, again, one of these things when you're thinking about self-help that it's beyond what we think as a museum or even a print residency. It's some other very interesting, strange hybrid of creative production and community sharing. Can I add to that, Dr. Zabata? Um, yeah, I want to say, like, one thing, I mean, the people can't see because it's not part of an exhibition or something is what happens at self-help that's unique is I will come to Betty or Marvea and say, can I do this blah, 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 crazy idea? And they say yes. And it's not like a, that's what's special about it because they don't, 
there's not a super hierarchy or um, they're just really open to ideas. And I think that probably started with Dr. Karen, I mean, uh, Sister Karen. So there's that. I mean, uh, just to, in reference to my teaching and bringing my teaching and my art together, I, one time I asked Betty, uh, oh, can I uh, bring my Rio Hondo photography students in here and do an exhibition? And she said, yeah, yeah, we can squeak. You know, like she figured out how to work that. So I think that's an important part that, you know, that's an exhibition that was pop-up that maybe there's no um, archive of that or there's no, you know, we got to work on that too, like having some kind of archive of those little things. But um, yeah, that's what another very important part of what happens there that people may not know of. Um, I just wanted to, to say one more thing. I, I'm deeply also grateful to the art historians, to the scholars. Um, it's really only been the last maybe 15 years that you begin to see the documentation and you see, you know, Chicanx, Latinx art written about. And, and that has really affirmed and validated much of what we've been doing over the years. And, uh, and the, the publications that self-help has been able to put out, uh, you know, with the contributors and the scholars and, and, um, and writers has been extremely important. And it wouldn't have happened if, if we didn't have that representation because representation was always the issue. That's why self-help graphics was so crucial because of the representation, because you were working, you know, with, with like-minded people and also with people with the same concerns, the same struggles. And so, and it's really because of the, the Chicanx, Latinx, and other, you know, writers of color that have taken an interest in the work and have documented it, and not only documented it, but, you know, thoroughly researched and, and are still doing the work, that all of this has come to the forefront. And so I think we really need to acknowledge that. And I just wanted to acknowledge the work that you've been doing as well to help spaces like self-help graphics and the artists themselves. So thank you. Any other question? Uh, time for one more question. Yeah. Um, yes, actually, it's uh, not so much of a question, but more of a, a statement, I guess. Uh, my name is Gloria Nerina Alvarez. I'm a writer. Uh, and uh, I also have a long history with self-help graphics. So I just wanted to talk about uh, and, and those of you who would like to uh, add something to this uh, about, you know, the, um, what made uh, self-help so uh, important, uh, in my opinion, uh, and experience was also the uh, multidisciplinary or interdisciplinary nature of it, you know, because along with the music that's been mentioned, you know, the Vex and, um, you know, there was also a lot of um, performance you know, art that was happening. Um, I know, uh, you know, we, we wanted also writers. Um, you know, there were, there were uh, artist books that were, that were created there uh, with a lot of different artists that, that we all know. Uh, and, uh, and then I know uh, for myself, you know, I tried to um, do things where, you know, we were, Irena was talking about bridging communities and, you know, trying to bring together people from the west side over to the east side, y vice versa, and uh, doing things. Uh, I know when I was doing, the, I did a residency with LACMA. We tried to tie it in with uh, Beyond Baroque and, and did some uh, uh, poetry festivals uh, with people from all over uh, uh, you know, the world stage. Then I was thinking about some of the artists that have come through, like Ulysses Jenkins, who worked there and, you know, did a lot with, uh, uh, you know, video and performance art also way back, you know, late 70s, 80s. Um, so, and, and Irena and I, who were part of a group there called uh, ESA, Eastside Artistas, and another group uh, that I was involved with uh, called... Uh, uh, Las Coyotas, you know, we did a lot of different things, a lot of events and exhibits. And um, so anyway, uh, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, a big thank you to the library for this opportunity, to our panel, 
to any artists, younger artists, students are uh, interested in any of this, we are very approachable. Come find me and I will introduce you to the artists and to the art historians. Um, thank you so much for coming and we hope to talk to some of you. All right, thank you so much. And uh, just before everyone leaves, uh, please make sure to check your wristband. Uh, we have five copies of the self-help graphics book. So if your wristband has a number on it, uh, you could see Steve there at the exit. He has a copy. And so if you have one of the five wristbands with the number on it, you're a winner. So congratulations. Ooh. Yeah. Ooh. <laughs> Thanks to the Alley Made Fund for that. <laughs> So thank you very much for attending today's Alamade program. And I want to make sure you do realize Alamade, we continue to support Self-Help Graphic. You're part of our performer list. Thanks to Cynthia, who's in the audience, who worked very closely with Kevin to make sure that happened. So if you ever look on our online calendar, you might see Self-Help at one of our local branches. So continuing to spread the joy of art. Mm -hmm. um, next week, and coming up, Sunday, December 17th, will be our next Alamade, the one closing out 2023. It will be Strong Words Holiday Show featuring a variety of writers, speakers, and musical acts. Gracias a venir. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you, all of the self-help graf graphics panel. Amazing. Yeah. And have a wonderful afternoon. Oh, and and do the art. art. Art outside. Yeah, Let's do go. Art, do the art problem. Let's go. Yeah. Let's go. All Let's right, go make it so happen. Much. Yeah. <laughs>